Hello and welcome back to another edition of Ballpark Mysteries Live. I'm David A. Kelly, the author of the Ballpark Mystery Books, and I'm really happy you're joining me here again for a uh, behind the scenes tour of the Ballpark Mysteries. And today we're going to be um, talking a little bit about the Wrigley Riddle. So this is book number six, it takes place in Chicago at Wrigley Field, the home of the Chicago Cubs. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this book shortly. But as I said, thanks for joining me. Um, if you haven't seen any of the other editions of Ballpark Mysteries Live, please look on my Facebook page, uh, Ballpark Mysteries, and you'll see some of the previous episodes. Um, last week, we took a behind the scenes tour of all the different Ballpark Mysteries uh, books and the Ballpark Mystery Stadium. So my characters have been to 16 stadiums. Here's a quick recap of the Ballpark Mystery books. And uh, last week we had kind of a behind the scenes tour of 16 of those stadiums. Uh, the week before that, we actually covered my picture book, Miracle Mud, which is a kind of a fun book about this stuff, baseball rubbing mud. So a nice tub, a nice brown mud actually used on all Major League Baseball. So if you don't know the story, you might want to investigate that. Prior to that, we of course also covered the first book in the series, The Fenway Foul-Up, which takes place in Boston at Fenway Park, the Boston Red Sox home stadium. And prior to that, we did The Colorado Curveball. This is the latest book in the Ballpark Mystery Series. It takes place in Denver, Colorado at the Colorado Rockies Stadium. And there's a lot of cool things happening in this book, including a snowstorm on opening day, which is kind of unusual, as well as some dinosaur action. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, I think you're going to have fun with today's dive into the Chicago Cubs Wrigley Field. Um, I also wanted to remind people to please take a look at my website. It's on the, the bottom of the screen there, davidakellybooks.com. You can also order signed and personalized copies of all my books from the website. And there are some other fun things on the website like teacher's guides. If you're looking for some activities or ballpark mysteries related activities for your son or daughter, as well as um, some things like missing chapters and some blogs that Mike wrote. So you can find some interesting back matter to the ballpark mysteries in the other books. So thanks again for joining. You can also sign up for my newsletter if you want to make sure you don't miss any exciting ballpark mystery activity and news. So what I thought to do, I'd do today was talk a little bit about the Wrigley Riddle. So this was book number six in the series. And as you know, my two main characters are Kate and Mike. They're cousins. They go to different baseball stadiums to take a tour or see a game. And uh, then they find a mystery that they have to solve. And in this book, the mystery is related to what you see on the cover, the ivy. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that as I dive into the presentation. And if you want to make sure you're asking questions, there's a comment area. Um, just feel free to put any comments uh, or questions for me. I'll be answering questions after the presentation and after I read a chapter of uh, the Wrigley Riddle. So let me see if I can bring up the presentation for you. And here we go. That's not the right one. How about there? There we go. <clears throat> So what you see on the screen in front of you there is a quick overview of the books I've published so far. The 16 team-based ballpark mysteries on the left. These are the books where Mike and Kate go to a specific stadium, starts off with the, the Red Sox, and then Yankees is book number two in the Pinstripe Ghost, and they go to Los Angeles in the LA Dodger, and to Houston, Texas in the Astro Outlaw, and the latest one is the Colorado Curveball. And again, you can read those books in any order. So whatever title is interesting or team is interesting, feel free to kind of jump right in there. On the right-hand side, we have the Super Specials. There are four slightly longer ballpark mystery books that are called Super Specials. And these take place in special, these take place um, maybe in special locations. So the first one is a World Series special edition. The second one is a Cooperstown Hall of Fame mystery. The third one is a New York City Subway Series surprise between the New York Mets and New York Yankees. And the fourth one is called the World Series Kids. And that's actually a great one because it's a, uh, a, a World Series, a Little League World Series in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. 
Below that, you see my MVP books. Uh, these are basically other sports mysteries. So there's a school Olympics mystery, a soccer mystery, a football mystery, and a basketball mystery. So if you like the ballpark mysteries, you'll probably like the MVP books. And then below that are the two non-fiction books I've written, uh, including Miracle Mud, which I covered in a previous uh, Ballpark Mysteries Live broadcast, and my other book, Babe Ruth and the Baseball Curse. But as I said, today we're going to be taking a look at the Wrigley Field in Chicago. Um, so let's dive into that. Let me see if I can get navigate there. So this is book six, The Wrigley Riddle, and uh, it takes place in Chicago. And here's a quick top-down view of uh, the Chicago Cubs field called Wrigley Field. And uh, it's a great place to see a baseball game. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it's uh, very different. So just quick geography lesson. Uh, Wrigley Field is a little bit north of downtown Chicago. So I've circled downtown Chicago there in the lower part of the slide that you're seeing. And um, you have to travel north uh, via car or uh, train and uh, Wrigley Field is up there and it's kind of wedged into Wrigleyville, a very cozy little neighborhood. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. And so a quick kind of uh, Wrigley Field stats slide here. Um, you can see the Cubs logo as well as a picture of Wrigley Field and the generic kind of field outlines and distances to the fences. Um, as I said, Wrigley Field is north of Chicago. It's um, kind of tucked into this Wrigleyville neighborhood. So there's lots of houses and apartments um, and just people living right around the stadium. It's kind of wedged in there tight, but it's a really fun place to see a game. It's actually the second oldest um, baseball stadium after Fenway Park. It opened in 1914 and the Chicago Cubs first game there was in 1916, I believe. And it's actually the oldest ballpark in the National League. So it's got a lot of history, uh, which actually is great for me as an author, because when I try to build the ballpark mysteries, I'm trying to include some team history or information about the stadium and the team as I build the story. So this was a really fun one for me to write about. And you may or may not have guessed it, or you may or may not know it, but a Wrigley Field is actually named after chewing gum, or actually named after the guy who founded the Chewing Gum Company. And we'll talk a little bit more about William Wrigley Jr. shortly, but uh, just know that the stadium uh, is named after chewing gum. The seating capacity is kind of, it's about 41,000 plus, uh, so it's cozy. Uh, it's a great place to see a game. And um, the first night game occurred at Wrigley Field in 1988, so um, it's a little bit later. I'll talk about that in a, in a second or two as well. So I thought I'd start off with a few interesting things about Wrigley Field, um, starting with the, the marquee. So when you go into the main entrance at Wrigley Field, um, you see this kind of red and white marquee it's just kind of a classic sign welcoming you to wrigley field and you really know you've you're in some baseball history when you see that sign so it's kind of fun i did not include that in the wrigley riddle and some of the things i'm going to show you as we go through today's presentation i was able to include in the book and other things i was not able to include so when i am writing a book like the wrigley riddle the first thing I do is I do a bunch of research uh, in my office, and then I take a trip out to whatever team or stadium that I'm writing about. So I traveled out to Chicago a few years ago, and I spent about five or six days uh, doing a lot of touristy things, going to baseball games, taking tours, and I collect a lot of information. And I never know what the mystery is going to be about when I'm doing that. Uh, so I have to collect as much as I can. And a lot of the things that I notice or take pictures of or take notes about don't actually make it into the book. But I want to have as much material as I can when I'm writing so that research trip I collect it. So unfortunately, the sign didn't really make it into the book, but it is a classic part of the Chicago Cubs and Wrigley Field. Uh, something that did make it into the book is the batting cages underneath the, the right field. Uh, seats, they're actually batting cages uh, with windows in them so fans can walk by in the hallway and see the Cubs or the other teams um, practice batting. 
And that actually was included in the Wrigley Riddle in one of the scenes where Mike and Kate are watching uh, one of their friends do batting practice. And so I was able to work that facet uh, into the mystery. And again, sometimes these things fit in and so sometimes they don't. Something that didn't make it into the book uh, is a really famous Cubs announcer, as well as general baseball announcer by the name of Harry Carey. Uh, he actually called baseball games for 52 years for a variety of teams, including 16 years at Wrigley Field for the Cubs. So he's kind of an integral part of the Chicago Cubs and Wrigley Field experience. Um, he's actually known or attributed for popularizing the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, uh, during the seventh inning stretch. So he actually got the crowd involved at Wrigley Field and the other fields when he was singing that and doing that. And so it's a really important, iconic part of um, baseball history. I wasn't able to work that into the Wrigley Riddle, but again, it's one of those things that I think about and try to find ways to put in there. And hot dogs. How could you not go to a baseball game and think about hot dogs? Um, and when you're in Chicago, you're not just thinking about hot dogs, but you're going to be thinking about hot dogs with this really incredible neon green relish. So here's a picture of a bottle of this stuff, as well as the relish on the hot dog. And it's unlike any relish you've ever seen before. It is so bright. It probably glows in the dark. Um, really kind of strange. First time I saw it, I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't know about it. I'm just wandering through Wrigley Field and I see people with hot dogs and it's got this bright, super bright neon green relish on it. And I kind of wonder what's going on, but it's delicious. So um, if you go to Wrigley Field, please enjoy that and have some. And if you really want a special hot dog at Wrigley Field or in Chicago, you're going to need to ask for... Um, you're going to need to ask for a dog dragged through the garden. So if you ask for a dog dragged through the garden, you're going to get what you see in front of you here. It's an all beef frankfurter on a poppy seed roll with yellow mustard, chopped white onions, neon green sweet pickle relish, a dill pickle spear, tomato slices or wedges, pickled sport peppers, and a dash of celery salt. So it's kind of got everything thrown in there. Um, and again, that's kind of a real Chicago experience or a Wrigley Field experience. So kind of fun to uh, take a look. Whenever I'm doing the research for the books, I'm always looking at what interesting food the team or the stadium or the city has. And Mike, of course, loves to eat. So sometimes I expose some of that food through Mike's actions or his interest in the food. Now, another thing to talk about, especially in relation to Wrigley Field here, is the weather. Um, uh, so here's another map, and you can kind of see Wrigley Field is highlighted there in the kind of bottom left. And um, Wrigley Field in Chicago is actually located right next to the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes are basically the largest... Um, uh, inland body of water, a massive amount of water, um, and this uh, can have a huge effect on the weather and the wind around Chicago and around Wrigley Field. So it's really important to remember this, um, uh, what it looks like on the map and what it translates to at the stadium. So let me actually just slip the slide. Here we go. So when you're at the stadium, when you go into Wrigley Field, the scoreboard, and I'll be talking more about that in a minute, but on top of the scoreboard, there's some flags. I'll be talking more about those in a minute. But the flags give you an indication of what the weather is like, or more specifically, what the wind is like. And the wind is going to have a big impact on the game. So right here in this photo, you can see there's some flags, and they're kind of blowing away from the scoreboard. That's kind of, they're blowing um, away from home plate. Um, that's a great direction for the Cubs. Uh, it means you're going to have a lot more home runs and um, it means that they have a better chance of winning. So actually here's, uh, here's a slide. I think this was in the show, one of the Chicago papers. Um, it shows the effect of the wind on baseball games at Wrigley Field. And you can kind of see I've circled some things. So you can kind of have the wind blowing out away from home plate or you can have the wind blowing in towards home plate or you can have a crosswind. And if you look on the, the left-hand side there, when you have the wind blowing out, 
the home runs per game are about 3.7 home runs per game versus 1.2 when the wind is coming into the stadium. So you really want the wind blowing out. You're going to get more home runs. And if you look in that center column on the bottom, uh, when the wind is blowing out, the Cubs record was 15 and 4 um, as compared to about 34 and 14 when it was coming in. So it's actually, um, it's actually pretty good. Now, uh, the wind, as I showed you, has the, some flags you can kind of pay attention to when you're at um, the Wrigley Field. And so the flags are on a mast above the scoreboard. And here's a little information card that was done in 1945. So it's a little bit old, but it's the flags are on a mast. Of course, you have the United States flag at the top, but then they actually put up the pendants for the different teams that are in the league and the standing. So um, on each side before and during each game, there'll be flags for each of the other clubs and where they are in the standing. So it's kind of a nice visual reminder um, for um, the fans to see where the Cubs stand and where the other teams stand. Of course, today's set of flags is much larger than what you see here. Um, and there's also a win and a loss flag. So you can see that when the blue and uh, blue and white flags for win and loss, those are flown after the game so that fans walking by the stadium will be able to see whether the Cubs won or lost. Or lost. So here's an example of both of them flying, actually. I don't know if that was after a doubleheader or just my guess is just at an off-season time. Um, so they fly the, the win or the loss flag after the game from the top of the scoreboard. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was actually the roof seats. And this thing is very unique uh, for Wrigley Field and for other stadiums. Um, as I said, Wrigley Field is kind of nestled right into Wrigleyville. And that means there are some buildings right across the street that are tall and can look right into the park. So over the years, um, roof seats were basically built on top of these buildings. And these people who owned the building started charging people to come in and watch the baseball game. Uh, so it's really kind of cool. I've circled them at the top of this photo. And now a number of those uh, roof decks are actually owned by the same people that own uh, the stadium. So they've kind of consolidated control of that, but still very unique to be able to see this game from outside the stadium. Here's another picture that I took when I was doing research uh, of the roof decks, uh, kind of long and narrow and tall. Um, I did not have a chance to see a game from there, but it seems like it'd be a really cool, I really like that second building with that long row of blue seats. Really cool to see a game from there. And as I mentioned, there's a special thing about Wrigley Field and night games. In fact, Wrigley Field was the last stadium of the major league stadiums to actually host night games. And it occurred in 1988. So relatively recently for baseball, um, until that time, the Chicago Cubs only played day games, and that was because they were in the middle of this neighborhood, and the neighbors did not want um, lights, really bright lights on at night, and they didn't want a lot of people coming to their neighborhood, noisy uh, people coming to their neighborhood late at night, so it took a very long time. There were some plans earlier on in the 1940s uh, and after to install lights, but um, they kind of never got off the ground. And in fact, in the 1940s, they had some lights, but they were actually donated uh, for the World War II uh, metal uh, scrap drive efforts. Um, and now I believe they're allowed to play about 40 night games at home. They don't necessarily play that many games, but that's how many, about half of their night or half of their home games could be night games. So Chicago Cubs still play an awful lot of day games which is a little bit unusual these days. So let's talk a little bit about chewing gum. And this is something that made it into the Wrigley Riddle. And I had a lot of fun trying to think about how I could integrate chewing gum into the mystery. And I'm not really gonna tell you a lot about that, but if you like chewing gum or mysteries, hopefully you will read the book to find out. Cause I had a lot of fun trying to figure out a way for Mike and Kate to use or encounter chewing gum and have that be part of the mystery because chewing gum is a really important part of Wrigley Field and the Chicago Cubs. So as I mentioned, um, William Wrigley Jr. actually created the, the William Wrigley Jr. chewing gum 
company. And um, he later bought the Chicago Cubs and Wrigley Field and was a big proponent of baseball. So here's a picture of him throwing out a baseball. And there's an early ad from Wrigley's gum that includes some baseball. And one of the interesting things about this story is he actually didn't start out to sell chewing gum. He didn't come out, he didn't start out to be the biggest, you know, chewing gum company in the world. Instead, he was actually selling baking powder. He was selling soap. And to sell the soap, he was giving away baking powder to entice people to buy the soap. But it turned out that people liked the baking powder more than they liked the soap. So he started selling the baking powder. But at, when he started selling the baking powder, then he started giving away two packs of chewing gum with every uh, canister of baking powder that he sold. And then it turns out that people liked the chewing gum more than the baking powder. So he started selling that. So he really kind of backed himself into this business of selling chewing gum and parlayed it into a really monster um, company that included the Chicago Cubs. Now, William Wrigley died in the 1930s, and at that point, his son, P.K. Philip Knight Wrigley, inherited the, the company and also the Chicago Cubs team, and he was involved in the team uh, until his death in 1977. Um, and he actually also, you may have heard of the movie A League of Your Own that came out uh, a number of years ago. Uh, but P.K. Wrigley was the owner who started the idea of having an all-girls professional baseball league during World War II. So he was uh, an instigator of that um, endeavor. And here's a picture of him on the left with a Chicago Cubs player and a goat. And we'll come back to the goat later on. This is not the most famous goat. It's just a picture of him with the goat a few years before the goat incident. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was the ivy. And the ivy is pretty critical. So you can see that on the cover. It's important enough that we really wanted to feature it on the cover of this book. And so here's a picture of the ivy. So at Wrigley Field, the, you have an outfield wall, which is made out of brick. Um, and the outfield wall is actually covered in ivy vines. And this is the same Boston ivy that's associated with Ivy League colleges like Harvard or Yale. Um, and it was planted in 1937 by a man by the name of Bill Veck, um, who also, uh, at the same time, the, the Wrigley Field included, uh, installed new bleachers and the new scoreboard. And the goal was to actually kind of make um, Wrigley Field more outdoorsy and kind of make it like a day in the park for people that were taking a day off from work or skipping school to watch a baseball game. So the idea behind the Ivy was just to make the park more friendly, less industrial, and more like the outdoors. And the implications, there are a few implications that are kind of cool. So one is just, it's really a great visual um, to see. Here's another shot of the Ivy from a different uh, from a different perspective. And you can kind of see, it just kind of rings the field behind the warning track. It's, it's really nice. Um, but uh, it has some implications. So if you're playing a game and the ivy is thick in the middle of the summer, the end of the summer, and the ball goes in there, it can get stuck. It can disappear. It can get lost. Players may not be able to find it. So if the ball disappears into the ivy, it's actually ruled a ground rule double um, if the ball gets stuck or disappears. So here's a shot of a Kansas City versus Cubs game from a few years ago where they're clearly looking for the ball. Of course, if you have balls that get stuck in the ivy, you might actually find them later on. So here is kind of a gross picture of a baseball that has perhaps lingered a little bit too long in the ivy uh, at Wrigley Field. But I just love the idea of these baseballs getting lost and not coming back for years. And another interesting thing uh, about the ivy uh, is the players watching them interact with it. So there's some cool shots of players kind of tumbling and trying to catch a ball uh, in the ivy, maybe disappearing into the ivy almost as they're trying to get the ball or uh, encountering it with their back like this. So a lot of fun action can be had with the ivy. And you can actually also purchase some of the ivy. And I took this shot uh, yesterday. So if you go to Chicago Cubs auctions, 
if you have an extra $200, you can buy an authenticated Ivy Leaf that was collected after the 2016 World Championship season. So after they won the World Series in 2016, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later on as well. But if you have an extra $200, maybe you want to pick up some Ivy Leagues, Ivy Leafs from uh, the Chicago Cubs. So let's move on from the Ivy to the Billy Goat Curse because there's some cool stuff happening here. And um, so the Cubs uh, have been around for a really long time. Uh, and they had been in the World Series and had some really successful seasons, but they've also had a lot of bad luck. And uh, they had a real long string of bad luck after this guy, Billy Cianus, tried to bring his pet Billy Goat to the 1945 World Series. Um, and he had tried to bring his pet Billy Goat, Murphy, to the game for good luck, but the Cubs basically said, we don't want that thing in here. It smells too much. Get the Billy Goat out of here. And according to the legend, Billy said, you Cubs, you're never going to win another World Series because you wouldn't let my goat watch the game. And after that, they not only lost that World Series, but they had a lot of bad luck. And so that's been associated with the Chicago Cubs since 1945. Uh, they had real trouble winning the World Series. Um, I actually referenced that, and I'll get back to this a little bit later in my book, The World Series Curse. This book is a, a World Series between the Boston Red Sox and the Chicago Cubs. I'll come back to it, but it's fun. If you like the Chicago Cubs Wrigley Riddle book, you'll like The World Series Curse. So uh, really cool history there. Now let's come back to the scoreboard because I told you about the scoreboard a little bit earlier on and, and the flags that fly on top of it. Um, the Wrigley Field scoreboard is big and very interesting. So uh, here's a shot of the scoreboard. It's actually one of only two uh, mechanical um, scoreboards in the Major League Baseball. Um, the other one, of course, is at Fenway Park and I talked about that previously when I went over um, the, the Fenway foul up. And what's interesting about this one, so the Fenway Park one is located at the bottom of the Green Monster. It's a big, long, wide scoreboard. This one is actually tall and big. It's actually three different levels or three stories high. Um, and it's huge. So it's really cool. The bleacher seats are basically kind of underneath it or in front of it. So it's a really fun place to see a game from. Um, there, it requires a number of scorekeepers to be in there to basically install the different scores as the game progresses. But if you, if you, that's your job, you want to make sure you visit the restroom before the game starts because there's no restroom in the scoreboard. Um, and it's also kind of high up. So uh, you are inside, but if you have a fear of heights, maybe it's not the place for you. You access it actually through a trap door at the bottom of the scoreboard. You climb up a ladder from the bleachers to the bottom of the scoreboard. So here's some uh, here's another shot of the scoreboard. You can kind of see it's way up above the uh, bleacher seats, and um, the the flags fly on that mast above the scoreboard. And here's a graphic again from a Chicago newspaper. Kind of a cool three level uh, cutaway view of the different aspects of the scoreboard. And you can kind of see, I think the person in the middle level on level two is the person who's responsible for watching the computer or the laptop that they have that tells them the scores from the other games that are happening. And then they have other people that run around and put the metal plates, the metal steel plates into the slots to be able to provide the scores for the other games. And you can see actually uh, the ladder there on the left-hand side that goes down to the um, to the bleachers. So that's how you enter and exit the scoreboard. And here are some here are some shots of the people inside the scoreboard. Looks like a great place to see a game. What what a view from up here. Um, so here's a shot from the top. Here's a shot of the inside. And here's a view down onto the field as you you would get if you're inside the scoreboard. And here's a view kind of looking out the side of the scoreboard and seeing some of those rooftop seats al um, along the street next to um, the Chicago Cubs. 
So when I'm researching these books, I'm also looking for things around the ballpark that my characters, Mike and Kate, might want to see or do. And in this book, they actually do go outside the stadium. Sometimes they're in the stadium, but other times they go around and do things in the city. So um, here's a couple of shots. Here's a shot of the Wrigley Building. Again, back to the chewing gum guy. Um, this was the world headquarters for the William Wrigley Jr. Chewing Gum Company uh, for many years. They have since moved out of there and other uh, companies are there. I did not include this in the story, but it's a beautiful building in downtown Chicago, right along the river. Um, and if you go, you know, take a tour of that area, you can take a boat tour, which is really great in Chicago. Uh, but there is another building that did make it into uh, the book, and this is the Willis Tower. It used to be the Sears Tower. It's one of the tallest buildings in the world. It was the tallest building for a number of years. And um, it's a really tall building. And up near the top, I've circled it in green, they have an observation deck. And so in the Wrigley Riddle, Mike and Kate actually go to that observation deck in this building and they get to experience these. They installed these exterior glass rooms or little glass annexes. So you can go walk out onto this piece of glass. You can kind of see there's two of them in a row uh, and you can see people in those and they are basically standing or sitting or lying on a piece of glass and looking straight down like a hundred floors down to the city. And maybe that's your thing. I didn't love it. Um, it's kind of cool to do, but it is a little bit scary. Uh, but I had Mike and Kate do that in the book. And it was fun again to have them do something a little bit different, but still really related to the plot. So also in this book, um, we're going to talk a little bit about ball hawks um, and Zach Campbell. So, um, the beginning of my book, um, The Wrigley Riddle, is actually, I put a dedication in there, and you can see here's a dedication, do, 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 there we go, and it may be hard to read with the camera I have here, but I've circled it on the page in front of you, and it's to Zach Hampel, author of The Baseball, and the best ball hawk that I know, 6,413 balls and counting. So there's a guy by the name of Zach Hampel who lives in New York City. And he's an author. He's written this book called The Baseball. If you like baseball or baseball history, it's a really interesting book to read. It's basically a history of the baseball and includes how they're made and just a lot of information about baseballs over the year, over the years. But also, Zach Hampel goes to baseball games and tries to collect baseballs. Uh, he's a ball hawk. And this is an important um, thing in Chicago outside Wrigley Field. So I included it in this book. So here's a picture of Zach with some of his baseball collection. He is currently, as of the end of last year, I think, up to 11,142 baseballs that he has collected during baseball games. And this includes batting practice as well as games, um, the important ones he labels and holds on to. Um, but he's got a lot of baseballs. So kind of an interesting uh, person, and he's got a website, he's got videos. If you want to see how to catch a baseball at different stadiums, he has guides to that and information, so it's kind of cool to experience that. Um, here's a picture of Zach Campbell on the front right there uh, in the, the black shirt with the, the, the Boston hat. He actually, I met him at a game at Boston's Fenway Park a number of years ago. Uh, we went to a game because I wanted to kind of see him in action, and this is batting practice. Uh, for an evening game at the end of the afternoon at Fenway Park, and he did indeed get a baseball, or he got, I think, about four that game, but this was, I think, the first one that he got that day, so it was kind of fun to see him in action and how he does that. But as that relates to Chicago and Wrigley Field, here's a picture of uh, Wrigley's left field. It's Waver West Waveland Ave outside the baseball stadium, and uh, it's basically a street in front of all those rooftop um, seats that we that I showed you earlier. And so sometimes during batting practice or games, baseballs get hit over those stands that you see in this picture, and they land right here on West Waveland Ave. And so this is where the ball hawks or people that want to catch a foul ball or a ball that hit, hits outside the stadium, this is where they hang out. So here's a picture of all the people or all the ball hawks waiting for one of the hitters to hit a ball outside the stadium. 
Uh, and for years, there have been some special, you know, guys or, and women that hang out here all the time and collect large numbers of, of balls from the Cubs. So again, kind of cool. I incorporated that. It's actually kind of an important plot point in this book. So it was really cool to kind of work that in. And I told you we'd get back to uh, the Billy Goat curse. So um, as I said, we have the Wrigley Riddle, which came out a while ago. And uh, 2016, I published this book, The World Series Curse. It's a, it's a ballpark mystery. Uh, it takes place at the World Series between the Boston Red Sox and Chicago Cubs. So it takes place both at Fenway Park as well as um, Wrigley Field. And I actually read a chapter of this in last week's epi episode of Ballpark Mysteries Live. Um, and it's a lot of fun. But in this book, somebody is trying to mess up the Chicago Cubs. They're trying to interfere with the Chicago Cubs' chances to win the World Series. But Mike and Kate are on the scene and they're going to figure it out. And they basically help figure out who's trying to mess up the Cubs. And to give you a little bit of a spoiler, in this book, the Chicago Cubs actually win the World Series. And um, I, Mike and Kate were the ones that kind of helped them overcome the person that was challenging them. And this was in August of 2016. And just a few months later, in November, the actual Chicago Cubs, they won the World Series for the first time in 108 years. Remember, they had the Billy Goat curse and had all this bad luck, and they were not able to win a World Series. But after Mike and Kate got on the case... The Chicago Cubs, just a few months later after the book was released, they actually won the World Series for the first time in 108 years. And you can bet that the Chicago fans were really excited about that. And I think Mike and Kate were really excited about that. And I think that's the end of the behind the scenes tour of the Ballpark Mysteries uh, episode. Here we go. Let me get back. Do, do, do. There we go. So that's the behind, end of the behind the scenes for the Wrigley Riddle. And what I thought I would do now is read the first chapter of the Wrigley Riddle to you. And then I'll kind of answer any of the questions that we have. So again, thanks for hanging in there. I had a few extra slides this week, so I know we're running a little bit longer. But let me read a little bit of the Wrigley Riddle, and then we'll get to any questions. So the first chapter in the Wrigley Riddle is called Trouble with Ivy. And here's a picture. There you go. Again, a great illustration by my illustrator, Mark Mayers. Love the work that he's done on the series. I talked a little bit about that last week. Uh, chapter one, The Trouble with Ivy. Heads up, Mike Walsh called from the top of Wrigley Field's bleacher seats. His cousin, Kate Hopkins, stood at the bottom, near the first row. It was three hours before the game, so the stadium was mostly empty. Mike fired a fastball down to Kate. She reached up to catch it but the throw was high. The ball sailed out into the outfield. Oh no, Kate cried. Thwap! The ball bounced off the foot of Louis Lopez, the Chicago Cubs star center fielder. Oi! Louis exclaimed. What's that? Mike's freckled face blushed. Sorry, he called out. I was playing catch with my cousin. I threw the ball a little bit too high. Mike ran down the steps to where Kate stood by the short green wall that overlooked the outfield. Louis shook his head. More like a lot too high, he said with a smile. I know our fans like to throw the other team's home runs back, but this is the first time that I've had a fan throw his own ball into the field. I guess I'm a little stronger than I knew, Mike said. He flexed his muscles, pretending to be a muscle man. Kate rolled her eyes. It's not about strength, she said. You're not going to make the major leagues if you can't aim better. Mike ignored her. He leaned over the outfield wall. Dark green ivy leaves covered the entire side. Where did it go? He asked Kate. Kate shrugged. Into the ivy, I think. Aunt Laura, can we come get my baseball? He asked Kate's mom. Mrs. Hopkins was standing in center field with Louis Lopez. Her short curly hair poked out from under a blue Cooperstown baseball cap. She wore a black messenger bag over her shoulder and scribbled notes on a pad. Not right now. I have to finish interviewing Louis by the time batting practice starts, Kate's mother said, and you can get the ball when I'm done. Kate's mom was a reporter for the website American Sports. She was writing a story on Louis Lopez and the Chicago Cubs' recent winning streak. Mike, Kate, and Mrs. Hopkins had taken a train from Chicago to Chicago from Cooperstown, New York, the day before. 
Mike and Kate lived down the street from each other in Cooperstown, near the Baseball Hall of Fame. They went to games with Kate's mom whenever they could. Cool, Mike said. Hey, Kate, did you notice the scoreboard yet? He pointed to the scoreboard. It was wedged into the back corner of the park, towering over rows of bleacher seats. It's huge, Mike said. I read that no one's ever hit a home run into it. They haven't, said a voice. Mike and Kate turned to see a man walking down the bleacher steps. He had a short black crew cut and wore a shiny blue Cubs warm-up jacket. I'm Paul Thomas, director for the, the media director for the Cubs. Your mom wanted me to say hello, he said. Mike's right. No home run has hit the scoreboard yet, but we get plenty of balls that disappear into the ivy down there. It's kind of weird that a baseball park has ivy growing all over the outfield wall, Kate said. Doesn't it mess up the players? Our players love the ivy. Wrigley Field, and actually here's a picture of Mike and Kate and the scoreboard, similar to what I just showed you. Wrigley Field just wouldn't be the same without it, Mr. Thomas said. P.K. Wrigley had the ivy planted and the scoreboard built in 1937. His family owned the Chicago Cubs. They also owned a big chewing gum company. That's, right, Rig that's why Wrigley Field has the same name as the gum. Then why don't the home runs stick to the scoreboard, Mike asked. He winked at Kate. Get it? Gum? Stick? Ouch, that's bad, Mr. Thomas said. You'll have to let me chew on that for a while. Kate groaned. Okay, enough, Mr. Thomas held up his hands in surrender. Your mother's almost done with the Lu her Louis Lopez interview. I'll take you to the field. Mike and Kate followed Mr. Thomas down some steps to the hallway under the bleachers. The gates had opened and the fans were starting to come in. They passed a food cart and turned into a long, narrow room filled with shovels, grass seed, and chalk. What's this room for? Kate asked. It's the groundskeeper's room, Mr. Thomas said. Maybe you'll meet Mr. Lee later. On the other side of the room, Mr. Thomas led them out through a door into a grassy outfield. Wow, Kate, look at this, Mike cried. Wrigley Field spread out before them like a ballpark from a postcard. Two green ribbons of seats wrapped around the field from first base to third. The famous ivy-colored outfield wall rose up behind them, rose up just behind where they stood. Beyond the wall were the bleacher seats. The giant green and white scoreboard rose to the pyramid of bleachers. Here and there, workers were setting up for that day's game. Louis Lopez waved him over. I know you can use some work on throwing, but are you any good at hitting, he asked Mike. You bet I am, Mike said, nodding. I hit a double in Little League last week. Well, how about you and Kate stop by the batting cage under the bleachers tomorrow morning? I need to work on my swing to keep our 11-game winning streak alive, Louis, Louis said, but I can give you two some swings as well. Sounds great, said Kate. I'll bet I hit more than Mike does. And here's the picture of Mike and Kate and Louis Lopez with the scoreboard and the bleachers and the roof deck in the background. No way, Kate, Mike replied. But if you do, I'll hit them farther. We'll see about that, Kate said. Then she thanked Louis, saying, Muchas gracias, Senor Lopez. Kate was teaching herself Spanish. She tried to speak it whenever she had a chance. Call me Louie, he said. He tipped his hat to Mike and Kate and Mrs. Hopkins and sauntered off the field. Mrs. Hopkins put away her notepad and checked her watch. We have to head back to the press room, she said. You two want to come? Wait, I need to find my baseball, Mike said. He jogged over to the right field wall. I know it's here somewhere. You're looking in the wrong spot, Kate called. She went to the center of the wall and scanned the area for Mike's shiny white baseball. I think it's over here. The outfield wall was about 12 feet high, and it ran from one side of the park to the other. It was covered top to bottom in leafy green ivy vines. The vines were so thick that Kate could make her hand disappear into them. She pushed the ivy near the ground aside with her sneaker. No baseball. Kate moved a few feet over. Again, she nudged the ivy back with her foot. This time, her toe hit something that moved. She leaned down. It was Mike's baseball. As Kate straightened up to show Mike the ball, she noticed a big red square in the wall. Mike, Mom, come here quickly, she said. Someone's ripped out the ivy. And that's the end of the first chapter. So in the rest of this book, they've discovered some problems with the ivy at Wrigley Field. And Mike and Kate have to investigate to figure out why someone would be ripping out the ivy. Perhaps they think there's a treasure buried there. You'll have to read the book to find out. But as you can see in that first chapter, I included a bunch of those things that I covered in the presentation, some of Wrigley Field's history and some of the cool features about it. 
So that's the reading for today. Let me take a look at our questions and uh, see what kind of questions we have. Thank you again for joining me, Sarah and Amy and Ben um, and uh, everyone. Sarah, again, let's see uh, if we have questions. Um, so there's a question, am I from Newton? I am uh, from Newton, Massachusetts. I live outside of Boston in a city called Newton. And that's where I'm calling you from today. It's where I do the writing. Uh, Jim wanted to know what my least favorite book that I've written is. Um, that's kind of a hard question. So here are, there's a quick shot of all the books that I have written. And I'm not sure if I have a least favorite. Um, they're all kind of different. There were some that were harder than others. So um, actually the uh, All-Star Joker book number five was harder because I had to write that. I uh, basically came up with a really good outline, but it wasn't that good, so I had to throw it away. Um, and um, I don't know. I don't think I do have a least favorite book, but that's an interesting question. Um, but thank you for reading all my books. And let's see what other questions we have. A number of comments. Um, Katie wants to know if I have any tips for writers. So, um, yeah, I've got some tips. Um being a writer is um, hard sometimes. It's like any other job out there. So I really enjoy it. I love writing books. I like writing other things. It's fun to share my thoughts with people and try to put something creative into a story. But sometimes it's hard. Um, so some of the tips that I have for writing are um, write whatever you can. Um, so sometimes I get stuck when I'm trying to write a new book. I don't know what the first page is going to be or what the first chapter is going to be, but I might have an idea for a different scene. So you can kind of write um, other places. You don't have to write in a linear fashion. You can write the ending first or you can write just a scene. Um, and I find that as soon as I have something on the paper, it's a lot easier for me to add to that or change it. But when I have a blank sheet of paper, it's really hard. So I just try to write anything when I get started. It doesn't really matter what I'm working on. And another tip I have is if you get stuck or if you don't have an idea, ask somebody else for help. So I ask other writers and I ask my sons and I ask my wife for ideas if I get stuck, if I need a clue or if I need help with a mystery. Um, I'll have them brainstorm with me and come up with ideas like what could the mystery be about at um, Wrigley Field. And in fact, in this book, I didn't have a good mystery. I had a lot of ideas of things that Mike and Kate could do, but I wasn't sure what the mystery was. And my son, Scott, he actually suggested the idea of a treasure. And then I kind of took that and I worked that in different ways. And the last writing tip I have is actually, sometimes I get stuck, as I just said, for ideas. And so you can look at other books or other stories or TV shows for ideas of mysteries or things that could happen. And you're not going to copy them directly, but you might take uh, some of the action or the idea behind something and try to figure out how it translates to your writing or to your, your characters. But thank you. That was a really great question. Um, so let's see. Um, so I have a question from uh, Tricia. Why do I like the Red Sox? So I have two favorite baseball teams. The first of them is the Boston Red Sox. And that's basically because I live near Boston. So it's hard not to love the Red Sox. And also because I featured them in my first book, The Fenway Foul Up. And I did that because, again, I live here. and It was easy for me to research them. My second favorite team is whatever baseball team I'm writing about. So uh, right now I'm actually writing a mystery about the Atlanta Braves. So that's my second favorite team at the moment. But that was a great question. Let me look for other questions. Um, so Cora says she likes my books. Thank you, Cora. Um, ben, yes, I see that we do have a website error on the missing chapter, and I will try to fix that after the... Uh, after the session today so come back later on and look for it and um from uh Yonatan, what inspired me to write each of the book and create the characters so what inspired me to write the ballpark mysteries was actually my two sons stephen and scott back when they were in elementary school they were playing a lot of baseball and they were reading a lot of mysteries and i kind of thought it'd be fun to put those together and I noticed that nobody had written any baseball mysteries. So I thought it'd be really, really cool to come up with mysteries set in baseball stadiums. And that's really what inspired me uh, to write the ballpark mysteries. And then in terms of the characters, I started out when the first version of this book actually had three characters, but it was terrible. Uh, the mystery wasn't good. The characters were bad. 
And when I rewrote it, I thought, you know, I'm going to just stick to two characters because that's a lot easier for me to write. So I ended up with the characters of Mike and Kate, and I made them up because I wanted them to have a bunch of characteristics that were going to help me tell the story. So, for example, in these books, Mike does a bunch of things like he's always got a baseball or a tennis ball with him. Um, Kate actually reads a lot, so she has a lot of information that helps them solve the mystery sometimes. So I came up with these characters that were going to have some characteristics that were going to help me tell the story. Um, so that's the answer to your question. Let me see if we have any others. Um, I have a question um, when Sarah wants to know when the next book is coming out. So the last book that came out is this one, The Colorado Curveball. It just came out a couple of months ago. And the next one isn't coming out till February. So I think that's about eight months from now, maybe. Um, and it's going to be a Minnesota Twins mystery. So hang in there. I know it's a long time. Uh, the book is done. I think it's being illustrated at the moment. And uh, next year, early next year, it will come out. And that's a really great book. And then the following year, we'll have the Atlanta Braves mystery. So that'll be fun as well. Uh, another question. So um, do I like, Ben wants to know if I like other sports. So I do like other sports. I like football, um, basketball, a little less than football and baseball. And um, I like to play catch with my son. Um, I like to go hiking and walking and things like that. Um, Rebecca wants to know who my favorite M, uh, MLB player is. You know, I don't really have one right now. A couple of years ago, my favorite player was David Ortiz on the Boston Red Sox. And um, once baseball starts again this summer, hopefully that will be in July, I will be watching a bunch of baseball games to try to find out who I think is interesting or exciting to watch. Um, so it's kind of fun to see different games. Um, let me see what other Ben wants to know what my favorite book is that I've written. So we went from least favorite to most favorite. Um, I kind of like the Fenway follow up since it's the first book, but I also actually really like, um, this book, the San Francisco splash, and I'm going to be covering this book next week. So if you like this, uh, edition of ballpark mysteries live, come back next Wednesday at two o'clock or check out my Facebook page, ballpark mysteries. I'm going to be giving you a behind the scenes tour of the San Francisco Giants Stadium in California. Again, some cool things going on there and, and reading a chapter from this book to you. So that was a fun book to write about. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Um, who do do? When is your next book coming out? I handle that. Um, favorite ball player. Um, and uh, Nolan and Miles say hello, so thank you. Uh, great to, to have you on again with me. And um, I think that's all the questions for today. So if you have a further question that I don't get to, um, you know, you can type it into the comments and I'll address it after today's broadcast. Uh, I did have one additional question. I did do Fenway. So again, Fenway is in this first book, the Fenway follow-up. So, and Fenway Park is also in the World Series Curse. So um, you can read this book if you want to get more Boston Red Sox or Fenway action. So thank you very much for joining us. I know this has been a little bit longer than some of the other ones. Um, please consider visiting the website, sign up for my newsletter. Um, you can order personalized books or you can get them from your favorite local or online bookstore. And um, thank you for joining me. And thank you for sharing the Ballpark Mysteries. And please tell your friends and teachers about it. And if you are in school uh, doing remote learning, uh, let your teacher know that I do free, short um, question and answer Skype visits with classrooms. And she can contact me via my website or he can contact me via my website if you want a free, short Skype with your school. So thank you very much. Have a great rest of the week. And um, hopefully we'll be back in baseball season soon.